It's a rainy day, and we have a wonderful crowd with us today, and we're glad you made it our way. In just a few moments, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 41, and through the remainder of the chapter. And uh, I guess at this time, if you are visiting with us, uh, one of our ushers, Barry Cook, will be walking down the center aisle, and if you can just get his attention, he's got a visitor's pack, and inside that there's a visitor's card, and if you will just take it and uh, fill it out, and you pass it to the center aisle, somebody will collect that. All right, now for our reading, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, let's join in, uh, God, in praising God in song. All the songs will be on the PowerPoint, but if you wish to follow along in a songbook, the first one will be 234. 234. Two hundred twenty. <clears throat> Two hundred twenty. I serve a prison savior. He's in the world today.
124. Following this for the RW will listen in our opening prayer. 124. Let us pray together. Our God and Father in heaven, the giver of all good and perfect gifts, the creator of all mankind, we trust our hearts are humble as we come before thy presence this Lord's Day morning. Father, we ask thee to bind the broken hearts and comfort those that mourn. We ask thee, Father, to look down with compassion upon those for whom we pray. Father, we are so thankful for every blessing that has come down from thy bountiful hand. We confess our unworthiness of all these things, and yet we know it's through thy great love 
that we're continually blessed as we are. We're thankful for the freedom that we have for this nation that we live in. We pray for those that are in seats of authority and leadership of this nation. That you would bless the decisions that they make. And if, if, if possible, that they would never bring reproach upon thy name and upon thy people. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful for a reasonable portion of health. We realize that good health is surely one of life's greatest blessings. And we pray for those that are not as fortunate as us today. Those that are sick and unable to be here, we pray that you would bless them with a renewal of health according to thy will. Father, we pray for those that are lonely. Would you bless them with the assurance of thy abiding presence? We pray, Father, for those that have never confessed Christ as their Savior. Not that you would save them in their sin, but that you would give them op ample opportunity to hear and obey the gospel. And if there be those here today that need to obey, that they may consider and do so before it's, while time exists and opportunity is here. We ask thee, Father, to look into our hearts at this time and Forgive us of any wrongdoing. We know that we are sinful creatures that we often say, do, and think things that may be contrary to thy will. Would you please forgive us of these things? And Father, we ask thy blessings upon the congregation of thy people here at Carthage. Bless our eldership with the wisdom and knowledge to lead this congregation in the way that would be pleasing to thee. We ask thee to bless the deacons in their work and bless each member that we would all work together in such unity that glory and honor would be brought to thy name. And Father, on that final day, we ask that you raise us from the grave and instill upon us the blessing of immortality. And it's in the name of our, thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who conquered the grave and brought light to mortality. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you wish to mark the invitation song, it'll be number 179. 179. Now, if you would, turn to 788. Stand if you care to do so. Sing them over again to me.
We're so happy you're here with us this morning on a uh, rather dreary Sunday morning, but there are so many things for which we have to be thankful, and even the rain, maybe an inordinate amount in our minds, uh, is a part of God's great scheme, so let's be thankful for the showers of blessings. But if you're visiting with us, we're truly honored that you're here, and we hope that you will come and be with us every opportunity that you have. The ushers are poised back there in the back with the study guides. If you would like one as they come down the aisle, uh, get their attention, and uh, you can take some notes on this morning's lesson. Hopefully you'll write down the scriptures, even the ones that are not on the screen, because uh, we had quite a bit to put on the screen today, and I didn't get all the scriptures in, but I hope that you will jot them down as uh, you have time and opportunity to so do. Everyone look up here. This is a Bible. This is a Bible. Maybe you have one in your hand. You need to look at it. Think about it. Because the Bible is not an aberration. It's right there. You can see it. You can touch it. You can open it. You can read it. You can close it. Jesus did all of those things with the Scriptures in Luke chapter 4 when He went to Nazareth. He went into the synagogue and He stood up to read. There was a book brought to Him. He opened it. He read from it. He closed it. He sat down and He said, This day, this Scripture is fulfilled in your ears. That may seem very basic, but it's vitally important. Lots of people do not respect this book, the Bible, but there are millions of people who do. I want us to study in a three-part series things about the Bible. We want to talk today about the origin of the Bible. In the 119th Psalm, you'll notice the words on the screen from verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. That denotes the fact that God's word exists, that he has made it known, and that it is, if you please, kept in the library of heaven by the Creator and by the one who is very close, very much interested in the salvation of our souls. That word is settled. It isn't up in the air. It isn't up for debate. It is settled. When God says something, then that's the way it is. There was a cliche a few years ago that became very popular. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You can leave out that middle statement. God said it, that settles it. And you could add then whether I believe it or not. God's Word is very important. We want to talk about the origin of the Bible. As we have already established, it's present. You can go in any number of bookstores, books a million or whatever, and there you'll find the Bible. It is said to be the bestseller of all time. I don't know really how you would measure that, but... Sometimes it's not even mentioned in the bestseller list because it's just understood that it's the bestseller, period. 
when you take into account all the different translations, all of the languages into which it's been translated, there are no competitors, really. You can go into any one of thousands of houses in this country, and there you will find Bibles. Usually not just a Bible, but Bibles. There's probably several in your house as there is in mine. It's just we understand the importance of the Bible. Go on Amazon. There you'll find, find the Bible. You can find all kinds of, of Bibles that are uh, maybe antiques, uh, very important. They've been around a long time. The Bible does exist. But we're asking today, how did we get it? How did we get the Bible? Where did it come from? We're, we want to look at the history of the English Bible. Not today in this lesson, but in a lesson to come. Uh, why are there so many translations? We want to seek answers to that question. What is the task of the translator? What is he to do in translating the Scriptures? Is there a difference between a translation and a paraphrase? We have many of those on the market today. There are so many specialty Bibles. What are some criteria that we should use to choose a Bible? And so on. These are all things that we intend to talk about and study. There's lots of sincere people who wonder whether or not the Bible can be trusted. How do we know? How can we know that it's accurate? How does it compare with other works that are accepted without any question? And yet those same people who receive those works say, well, I just don't know about the Bible. I don't know if we can trust it or not. So we want to examine and talk about uh, lots of those things. Today, we want to ask, what about the origin of the Bible? From where? From what? From whom did the Bible come? Can we ascertain anything about this question? So let's talk first of all about the possibilities of origin. First of all, there's a possibility that it created itself. Somebody says, well, that's preposterous. I agree. But I wanted to throw that out as a possibility because there's lots of people in the world today who say that that's how the universe came about. It created itself. It just happen through spontaneous generation from the Big Bang, whatever. It, it just happened. And yet there is so much design. There are people who would have us believe that the universe that has the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the stars, some of which are larger than the sun, all the animals, all of the things that we see from day to day, even man himself just happened. Just happened. Are we to believe that the Bible just happened? Someone has said, and I've read it many times in many different forms, that the possibility of the universe as we study it and observe it today coming into existence by accident or pure chance would be as likely as Webster's Dictionary being the result of an explosion in a printing shop somewhere. Did the Bible come about as a result of an explosion in a printing shop? And when all the dust had cleared and everything had settled back to the earth, well, there laid a Bible. 
bound, usually in black leather. Uh, can be other things. And with all the paper and the ink and all that, did that we know that didn't just happen. A second possibility is that it is completely and exclusively the production of man. Created by men. It's agreed that there's somewhere between 35 and 40 different writers of the Bible. There's some who question that a certain book was written by the ascribed author or writer, better said. But generally it's understood that about 40 men penned the Scriptures under the guidance, of course, of God over a period of something like 15 to 1,600 years. And there are those who would say, why, it's just a human production. And... Nothing else has been involved. They all got together. Some of these people talk as if all of these people lived at the same time and they said, hey, let's get together and let's produce a book to deceive the masses and to cause them to be superstitious and misled and let's have us some fun with that. But these people didn't all live at the same time. Some of them wrote about things that would happen hundreds of years after they died. And the detail of prophecy, and we'll give you some examples of that later on, is really astounding. It's true that there are men who were involved in the production of scriptures. It's true that the Bible is printed thanks to Mr. Gutenberg, the invention of the printing press. And there is a great availability present in our world today of the Scriptures because of the efforts of man. But there are several things that make it difficult to conclude that the Bible is a production of man. We'll examine some of those in lessons to come. The third possibility is that the Bible is a spiritual as opposed to a secular work. And as you look at it, you cannot help but believe that God orchestrated this, and I'll give you some examples of that in a few minutes, utilizing human instrumentality but it has been preserved by His divine providence throughout the long, illustrious, and sometimes hazardous history of the Scriptures. There have been those who have said, by the time I die, the Bible will be non-existent, only to have the Bible read at their funeral. Thomas Paine made that boast on one occasion that he would see to it that by the time he died the Bible would be extinct. Thomas Paine has long since been buried and we're still reading the scriptures today. And so it is that the Bible has been preserved. Attack after attack has been made against it to destroy it forever. And yet the Bible remains. I would suggest to you that the last option that we just mentioned is supported biblically. I want to give you a few examples of that. Jot them down. Think about them. Study them. A logical place to begin is always at the beginning. Genesis 1 opens within the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. But what I want you to concentrate on in Genesis 1 is the statement, And God said. And God said. The first recorded utterance from God Himself is very short and to the point. 
That statement is, let there be light. Let there be light. That was the first recorded words of God. And then we have, and there was light. God, who is the great light, created the light that we know and enjoy and appreciate today. But in Genesis 1, after you leave verse 3, go to verse 6, and God said. Go to verse 9, and God said. Verse 11, and God said. Verse 14, and God said. Verse 20, and God said. Verse 22, and God said. Verse 24, and God said. Verses 26, 28, 29, and God said. God is speaking. That tells us that God has the capability of speaking. He spoke. Evidently, to the other two persons of the Godhead, when he said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. When he created man, lo and behold, he spoke to the man and the woman, telling them to multiply and replenish the earth, and giving them other instructions as well. When you come to Genesis 2, you see the same pattern. God talks with various ones. God said over and over. Chapter 3, same thing. Chapter 4, you come on up to the flood. God said to Noah. He gave him instruction. You kind of get the idea after reading a while in Genesis that God speaks to people. He has spoken to man. And the New Testament, looking back to that, said God has spoken in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, and He has in these last days spoken unto us through His Son. Anytime that you have a document that claims to be authentic, you have to disprove that claim to prove that it is inauthentic. Any of you in this audience where I worked and do work in banks, and you know that there is a procedure that you follow when someone gives you a hundred dollar bill that there might be some question about. You hold it up to the light. I've had the fun a time or two when I would uh, uh, go to Walmart or somewhere and and give them a $20 bill, don't always use plastic. I give them a $20 bill, and I say, do you still take cash? And sometimes they'll smile, and they'll invariably hold that $20 bill up to the light. When they give me my change back, I sometimes take one of those and hold it up. See, see if it's authentic, and they always laugh and smile uh, because there are ways to determine that. There's ways to test that. Well, you can test the authenticity of Scripture. But don't forget to go back to Genesis and continue reading. The so-called Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, is believed by most conservative scholars to have been written by Moses. Is there any reason to believe that? Well, in, Deut- or rather in Exodus 24, verse 4, we learn, and this is a quote, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And you find that statement or similar statements several times. In Exodus 34, 27, 28, Moses wrote the words of the Lord. Deuteronomy 27, verse 3, references made to that. And even on up in Joshua's time, in Joshua 3, 9, Attention is called to the words of the Lord which Joshua was making known to the people. A generation had passed. Joshua was addressing, as Moses did in the book of Deuteronomy, a new generation. But it was still the word of the Lord. 
The Lord had something to do with that. He had spoken. And Moses was repeating what God wanted him to teach the people. And Moses had made a record of it. In fact, Moses is said to have told Aaron all the words of the Lord. Exodus 4, verse 28. But when you leave those first five books and begin reading onward, there's literally hundreds of passages that have the quote, the word of the Lord within them. The word of the Lord over and over again. The book of Psalms contains scores of this and similar statements. The word of the Lord, the Lord has spoken. The Lord said. It's very evident that God had a hand in it. Psalm 19 that we're presently reading on Wednesday night. We're reading section by section all the way through. If you'll come on Wednesday night, you will have read 119th Psalm. It's a tribute to the Word of God. And it exalts it and magnifies it in such a beautiful and powerful way. God has spoken. You come to the books of prophecy in the Old Testament. And again, you have the same thing. In Isaiah 51, 16, God speaking to Isaiah said, I have put my words in your mouth. And there's all kinds of statements like that. Sprinkled very liberally throughout the Scriptures. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1.9, the same thing is said. I put my words in your mouth, Jeremiah. I want you to tell them to the people. Same is true in Ezekiel. Same is true onward into the minor prophets. If you will look at the first verse of the books of Hosea, Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, every one of them began in the same way. The word of the Lord came unto that prophet. Every one of them. And there's lots of other statements that are very similar to those. But what about the New Testament? As we come to the New Testament, Jesus clearly recognized the Scriptures as authoritative. In reference to conduct, doctrine, things of that nature, He recognized it as authoritative. When some of the Jewish leaders would question him about a matter, to what did he appeal? He appealed to the Scriptures. How many times did Jesus ask them, Have you not read? That is, if you want to know the truth about this matter, you need to read the Scriptures. And you will find out the truth of the matter. Jesus in John 5, 39 said, search the Scriptures. For in them you think that you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Search the Scriptures that you might have eternal life through me. That's what he's telling the people. He urged their reading of the Scriptures and their acceptance. In John 10, 35, he said, the Scriptures cannot be broken. Uh, that is in harmony with our text. Thy word, O Lord, is settled forever in heaven. It's a settled matter. Not up for debate. When God has spoken, that's what he means. Saul, the king of Israel, learned in a painful way that when God tells you something, you need to count on it and do it. The kingdom was wrested from him. 
as a result of, her, uh, of his disobedience. Saul, in essence, said, well, I know what God said, but I just thought, I just thought it wouldn't make any difference to save a few of those choice cattle and even bring old King Agag back and let the people see that we had indeed conquered him. God said, no, I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. God had his reasons for that. We need not even question them. The scriptures were to be fulfilled. Jesus said, this is going to be done that the scripture might be fulfilled. John 13, 18, John 17, 12, 19, 24, and several other texts has that point to make. The scriptures are something that must be fulfilled. So these are things that show that Jesus accepted the Scriptures as authoritative. And then the apostles understood the need for Scriptures to be fulfilled. In reference to Judas' replacement in the apostles' listing, we find that the Scriptures must needs be fulfilled. That which had been predicted had taken place, and so Matthias was chosen. It was used to convert others. Go back and read the sermon in Acts 2 and see how many times Peter referred to the Old Testament Scriptures to make his points. We find that the Ethiopian eunuch was taught from the Scriptures by Philip and learned about Jesus and what he needed to do to be saved from his sins, which he did in Acts chapter 8. It was used to establish the truth in Acts 17. Paul went into the Jewish synagogue and he reasoned out of the Jewish scriptures with those Jews there assembled, proving that Jesus was the Christ. The Thessalonian Jews did not really cater to that too well, ran him out of town. Some of them believed went over to Berea, and the same thing happened again as we studied in a lesson just a few weeks ago. But note that the Scriptures were viewed as authoritative, and the Jews studied them in Berea to see whether or not the things Paul taught was true. The apostles were bound by what the Old Testament Scriptures had said In pointing to Christ, they utilize those to lead men to Him. They were not free to alter, change, and say, well, I don't guess this prophecy applies. It did apply, and they applied it accurately. In Acts 18, 24 through 28, we read of that eloquent Apollos, man with an orator's tongue, He didn't know the way of the Lord completely. Quill and Priscilla expounded unto him the way of the Lord more perfectly. And then he proceeded to preach and teach the gospel and to utilize the scriptures. He was mighty in the scriptures to prove that Jesus was Christ. Acts 18, 24 through 28. There are three classic passages at which I want you to look. I want you to write these down, and we may not have the time to read them all and make as many comments about them as we'd like. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 9, and reading on through verse 13. You'll find that Paul points out that that which he preached and subsequently wrote was taught him not by the learning of man, but by the Holy Spirit. And so he says, beginning in verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. This is a quotation from Isaiah 64, verse 4. He goes on to say, that God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For a man knows 
for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. Notice, God revealed through Paul and the other apostles the things previously unknown, that we might know them. He further explained that the gospel which he preached was being revealed by the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, or 17 rather, you'll remember that Paul said to Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. And then he says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And these same Scriptures are said to be fully sufficient for spiritual guidance, growth, and even glory. And then in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that reveals to us the fact that God is involved. The Bible is from God. It is reliable. It is true. It will not pass away. But the Word of God will judge us in that last great day. We would urge you to obey it today by receiving it and obeying it. Would you come if you're subject to the invitation as together we stand and sing? God is calling us. Following the contribution, we'll sing number 268 in preparation for the Lord's Supper. 268. Shall we pray? Our great and glorious Heavenly Father, 
we're grateful for an opportunity at this time to give back a portion of what we have. We're grateful that we are able to help further the boundaries of your kingdom, to help those in need, and to help those who are spreading the gospel to, to other people. Father, we pray at this time that we give back cheerfully, knowing that what we give will be to great benefit to everyone here and to the others that receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed Heavenly Father, we come now around this table in remembrance of your Son and our Savior Jesus, looking back on the suffering he endured for everyone. And Father, as we partake of this bread, which represents Jesus' body on the cross, may we look back and realize the true love he had for all and through his suffering and pain. May we protect this in a manner that will be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
most holy Heavenly Father, we continue in our remembrance of your Son and our Savior and the sacrifice of himself on the cross. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus shed, blood that shed and flowed to wash away our sins so that we too could become good and faithful Christians. Father, we truly want to remember him and the love he has for all and the great sacrifice he gave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The closing song will be 332, and Brother Steve Harper will be leading us in our closing prayer. I apologize for any distraction that my actions a while ago uh, may have created, but it was a necessary action, so that's enough said. We do appreciate so much your presence this morning, and we hope that you will come and be with us again really, really soon. We have several notes about the sick, and uh, we will hasten through these as quickly as possible, but uh, we hope that you will remember all of these in your prayers. I hope that I can get them all. Uh, we first want to express our sympathy to the R.W. Vincent family and the death of his sister-in-law, uh, Lois Jean Vincent, as she passed away Friday. And her funeral services will be Thursday in Middletown, Ohio. And she was the widow of uh, R.W.'s late brother that died just a few months ago. Uh, also, we want to remember Sister Sue Walker. She will be having a bone marrow test on Tuesday in Nashville. Faye Mayberry continues to recuperate. And Jeff says she is doing better but she is still not feeling really well. Uh, also, a friend of Carol Woodard, Miss Faye Massey, suffered a broken hip and has been in Re Riverview Regional. And Joe Kemp is improving after suffering a stroke and a blood clot in his heart uh, last Saturday. And Mary Helen Apple remains in rehab, but may go home tomorrow. Also, Scotty Yeaman has not been as well this week. Uh, he had a UTI, and Ye is there with him this morning. Little Kennedy Ferris, who is the granddaughter of Darlene, uh, has the flu, and uh, we are very sorry for that. The Crockett clan, Jeff and Lacey's family, have had the flu the last couple of weeks, and 
we need to remember them as well. And also, uh, Joey Shockney, a cousin of Susan Clam, is in a hospital near Dixon, Tennessee. He had the flu that turned into double pneumonia. He also has a stout infection in his blood, and the family requests our prayers. That's Joey Shockney. And uh, Justin tells us that uh, the man will be leaving the building next Sunday, the 18th, at 4 o'clock for Youth Unite, which will be at Center Grove. That will be at next Sunday on the 18th. Uh, we request your prayers for Michael Thomas, uh, our son-in-law, who is on a medical mission trip to Africa, and uh, we hope that uh, you will keep him in your prayers as well. <coughs> we have received greetings from Michael and Gail Jacobs and family, and they speak of their love for the church here. Let's remember them in their new work as well. Birthdays include Derek Coblitz on the 13th and Haven Brown on the 15th. We have no wedding anniversaries. That's surprising since it's close to Valentine's Day. Elders Deacon's Preacher's Meeting will be this Wednesday evening uh, after services and copies of the agenda are available in the foyer. I believe that's all the announcements that I have. If you have other things that need to be put in the bulletin, be sure to get those to Elaine or to myself. Uh, sometime uh, today, uh, call the church you're building and leave a message on the phone uh, by Monday. Uh, because the bulletin will be concluded on Tuesday, our Lord willing. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Some work has been done on the uh, classrooms downstairs. I know Jackie and R.W. were involved, and there may be some others that have helped with that uh, in the last few days that I didn't know about. But anyway, we appreciate uh, their work, and I think those classrooms will soon be back in operation. Uh, let's stay for Bible study. That'll be coming up in just a few minutes. And then come back tonight, 6 o'clock, children's class at 545. Let's stand for the closing song and prayer, if you would. Father, we come to you giving thanks for the stage you bless us with. Thankful for the opportunity that we've had to come and study and worship you. Thankful for Jesus and the life he led and the example for us to follow. And most of all, Heavenly Father, thankful that he really went to the cross for sinners like us that we now hope their last in life where they we obey and trust you. We thankful for the many blessings that we take from Granny from day to day. We pray for those that are less fortunate than we are. Pray for all those that were just mentioned and need of our prayers that are recovering and those that are having tests and those in hospitals and nursing homes. We pray for those that have, are suffering from the loss of loved ones. We pray that we comfort them only you can. We pray that you'll go with us through this uh, next Bible study. As we leave, we pray that you'll keep a safe hand over us. We realize that we are weak and simple creatures. We say and do things contrary to your will. We pray that you'll forgive us these things this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.